Hello everybody in MC201. <clears throat> Welcome back. Uh, this is day two. So far you've just been through the syllabus, syllabus lecture, and gotten an idea of kind of how the class is going to run. Uh, hopefully that was relatively easy Monday for you. Um, the reading was just five pages long and it was just a syllabus. It was just a plan for the rest of what's to come. Uh, the quiz came directly out of the lecture and the same thing is going to happen today. Um, we're going to go through the introduction and chapter one material today, which are both posted. Uh, if you haven't read those yet, read those before viewing this lecture. Definitely read them before taking the quiz. And things will proceed this way, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and fire this up so it's full screen here. Let's go, bud. A little bit of uh, housekeeping, syllabus quiz statistics and housekeeping. The average score on quiz one, the syllabus quiz, was 22.63 out of 25 points. So a lot of E's out there. A couple people didn't complete it. If you need help, contact me. Let me know if you need some help. Um, accessing the material, uh, if your internet was slow or something. There were, there were different cases of people having kind of trouble with internet connections depending on their service provider and where they live and whatnot. So if you had trouble um, the first day just kind of figuring out how things work or, or you know maybe you didn't quite understand we're going to have a quiz every day and that every day is like a week of material, uh, <clears throat> let me know. And um, for those couple of people, if they want to, you know, to try to make up those points, I'll come up with some other alternative thing for them to do. Um, just for this one day though, just for Monday, because it was the first day of the class. Questions uh, are going to keep coming from readings and lectures, lots of hints in the lecture uh, for the quizzes. Exams won't be so easy. There are going to be terms and topics that you have to study. I'll give you a review sheet in the review, and I'll talk about some, you know, some basic ideas for how to approach each exam each Friday, but there aren't going to be gimmies in the lecture uh, in, in the um, exam reviews the way that I'm doing for these quizzes. You're going to have to go back and look up the topics and uh, make your own um, review sheet. Uh, if I were you, I'd write it out by hand because it's a little bit easier to commit to memory that way and then you'll have something handy uh, literally right next to you when you take the test. Uh, it's fine by me. It's an open note thing. Uh, I just want you to study and learn this material. It's looking like afternoons. Oh, also, um, you should know that the First two Friday exams are going to be um, multiple choice only, but the cumulative final exam on January 5th is going to be multiple choice, short answer, and essay. I've, I've mentioned that in the lecture and in the syllabus, but I wanted to make it clear that um, the cumulative final is kind of a big deal. It's half of the grade for the class and is going to include um, you know, all of those things. And I'll give you the topics for multiple choice questions and the topics um, for uh, you know, from which I'll draw short answer questions, and I'll give you a couple of uh, essays to prepare ahead of time, a couple of essay questions, and then <clears throat> just one of those will appear on the exam. That's how I like to do it in 201, keep it simple, but make sure that you're preparing, uh, make sure that you're learning something. It looks like afternoons are the time, uh, the best time for people to take quizzes, so I'll probably leave the test open for the final exam all the way from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., but then I'll create a bank of uh, test questions. So there will be you know, many more multiple choice questions and short answer questions than would appear for any given person. So no two people are taking the exact same test, um, but everything will be on the review sheet. Um, for essays, the essays, I'll probably just give everybody the same essay and see how you write it, write it out. Um, I'll give you a couple to prepare, and then, like I said, one of those two essays will be on the final exam. Why am I talking about the final so far ahead of time? I think just so you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and kind of mentally prepare for, you know, that final exam, which is going to be half your grade. You need to know what you're what you're looking for as you're reading this material and you're going through these lectures. So that's it. Um, you know, pretty much this whole class is about how mass media relates to, <clears throat> um, you know, societal change and cultural change and how information and communication technologies are evolving and how that um, can drive but not necessarily you know cause um, social and cultural change so I, I'm, I'm certain that the essay at the final uh, will have something to do with that both essay questions that I have you prepare will be kind of different versions or different aspects of that same topic 
All right, <clears throat> the introduction to the textbook. Um, this is the old version of Media, Society, Culture, and You. I was kind of proud of that cover. So I went ahead and slammed it back up here for you to look at. Now it's, uh, it's in a new iteration as an online text. Hopefully this was readable for you. You're kind of um, the first ones to see this new version of the text. Uh, besides, uh, you know, one of my editors over at the Rebus, and hopefully you're enjoying it, and it's uh, relatively easy to read. Um, I'm welcoming your feedback anytime you want to tell me about it. Um, the intro just explains that this is an open educational resources text, first created for Apple's platform, but that was kind of limited. Apple um, <clears throat> wants to review things for two, three, four weeks before they publish it to... Uh, to the um, Apple Store, to their you know their bookstore, and I never charged any money for it, but um, it would always take a couple, three, four weeks for them to review, and then wouldn't always be ready for the very beginning of class. So I kind of like how Rebus works; it just goes direct to web. Um, if you've been able to download them, that's good. Um, you should be able to access um, other parts of the book that haven't yet been revised. Uh, you can look at them if you want, but I'm going to post the link in Blackboard every day to the most up-to-date version. So I don't mind if you look ahead at the textbook, but bear in mind it will change. I will edit <clears throat> every chapter as we're going through this, and it's just because it's, it, you know, material needs to be updated because the technologies are changing so fast and the concepts sometimes have to adapt, or at least the way we look at the concepts needs to adapt somewhat. Um, this particular version is created as an accessible introduction to these core concepts and theories. Um, I've taken out some supplementary videos, um, some supplementary readings that I had kind of pasted into this uh, this iBook is what it was when it was on Apple's platform. Um, so it's a little bit stripped down and updated, and hopefully that works well for the winter session. So let's go to it. Chapter 1, Media, Society, Culture, and You. Here are four key definitions. I'm just going to go over them for you because definitely always quiz ab about society and culture and those terms show up again <clears throat> on exams every semester because I just think those are the sort of foundational uh, concepts of the class. Society is, uh, according to this textbook, a very large group of people organized into institutions held together over time through formalized relationships. That's the textbook definition. There's a lot more going into what makes up a society. But the point is, societies are meant to help keep groups of people together, very large groups of people together, to help them survive and to thrive. So all these things that have to get done, they, they get formalized in one way or another. Um, and you know we, we can organize our, our, our work life into the institutions that we work for and our upbringing into the institutions like family and church and school that uh, you know a lot of us were part of uh, coming up and um, that all you know coalesces as a formal social structure um, and it, it can't completely be separated from culture but culture needs a different definition there's more there's more to life than just the social institutions that you're a part of you know your job and your church and and uh, you know your family uh, and and you know, the industries or whatever that you that you um you know that you're consumers for there's also culture um, which is the knowledge beliefs and practices of groups large and small so that is meant to be all-encompassing and really broad uh, but <clears throat> it includes um, artistic production and uh, you know historical knowledge knowledge passed down through traditional means also um knowledge developed through science. Science is kind of tough to peg. Is it culture or is it society? Because science influences culture quite a lot, but a lot of um, what we discover through science is developed by our institutions. So that's one place where there's a lot of overlap between um, what society does and what culture is. Uh, but all I'm going to quiz you over are these two textbook definitions on this slide right here. Uh, institutions are groups of communities organized according to formal rules. Uh, and so I've already talked about what institutions are. I have a hard time talking about society without jumping to the de definition of institution. Uh, but they're just so important uh, in our world. And it's a, it's a big term. It's a broad term. But it means uh, getting people together in formal structures to, to get things done, to either keep us safe or keep us fed or keep us uh, informed. Um, you know, institutions or keep us educated. Institutions, you know, run the gamut. But anything that uh, 
we've been working on as a civilization for for many many years um you know sooner or later it gets organized into more and more formal institutions cultural production or material culture um is important to discuss because um this this is basically the the evidence of culture or the, the product of culture products related to our knowledge and beliefs that express all types of passions from food to music to art so you know if what you know of culture is what you see in a museum about some prehistoric culture yeah that's 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 the those are the artifacts that's the material culture it's baskets and it's how people built their homes if they were made of you know mud bricks or if they're if they're you know made igloos or something like that um you know that's that's kind of the prehistoric what you see in a museum version of culture but culture is also just um our music and our art and the movies that we like to watch uh sometimes twice in one weekend you know what i'm saying um culture is is um what we're passionate about and um i throw into the textbook that sort of classic reference from the from the film dead poet society it's you know, it's referencing poetry, but basically it's talking about all of culture and sort of the 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 the, the, pro the project of the humanities, which is you know the things that we live for: literature, art, music, uh, uh, all those things. This is not in the textbook, but this is the kind of thing that I like to toss out in an exam just to see if people are paying attention to my lectures. Um, you can divide culture into high culture, pop culture, and folk culture. High culture is generally just whatever people in higher classes um, decide to declare is is high culture. Um, it can be opera, it can be ballet, it can be classical music, it can be high art. Sometimes high concept art, though, is an eye of the beholder. Uh, sometimes there's not much to it, depending on um, <clears throat> you know what trends are in art. But High culture is often determined just by class and what people of a high class uh, perceive to be the most valuable. Um, it's not only, uh, you know, two or three hundred year old classical compositions or, or, or something like that. You know, there, there's, there's new cultural production of the high culture variety. Um, but it tends to be, you know, um, it, it tends to be of the type that, uh, people who, who are, you know, purposefully um, expressing high class uh, would, would consume. Um, there's there's going to be crossover between high culture and pop. There's going to be, you know, um, intersections between these two at times. Um, but the basic idea is um, high culture comes from, you know, sort of that, that high class position. Pop culture is just everything that's massively popular. Star Wars, pop music, uh, a lot of sports. Um, pop culture is the easiest category to think of examples for because it's most of what you see. Um, but it's not separated out by people who are sort of conspicuously consuming higher versions of art. Um, pop culture is just everything that's popular with the, the um, largest masses of people. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not to say that high culture is better or worse. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't say pop culture is better than folk culture. What signifies folk culture, as far as we're concerned in this class, is that it relates to something that um, is both an artistic expression and that has a practical function. So, um, you know, a piece of folk art might be a, a blanket that also obviously serves to keep people warm, or it might be a gaming table that people can use to play chess and checkers, or uh, it might be a folk story. And you might say, well, how is a folk story useful? But it, it often will have a moral. It will tell people how to live. There will be some sort of um, uh, ethic involved in it. And this is not to say that pop stories don't have morals, but for folk culture, uh, the point of, of, a, of a story often is to convey, you know, uh, sort of thinly veiled um, uh, um, concepts about how you should live your life. Um, and they're often very practical morals as well. So um, on this first quiz, you're definitely going to see uh, society and culture in the multiple choice. When we roll around a Friday's exam, make sure that you 
look at high culture, pop culture, and folk culture again and be able to give me some version of those kind of long-winded definitions that I just gave you. The role of the mass media is the next chunk in chapter one. You should know that medium is singular and the term media is plural. And there, there, are, there's, there are several different media channels. One medium is television. One medium is radio. One medium is magazines. One medium is newspapers. Um, <clears throat> each social each social media platform can be considered its own medium. You know, Twitter's a medium. Facebook's a medium. You get the idea. Uh, I don't like saying the media because that's it's not always clear what that means. Our entertainment media included in that. Um, our um, you know news media the same as entertainment media of course not so when people say the media they often mean something like popular cable television news media or you know a handful of New York and Washington DC newspapers and then you know sort of the big three cable TV networks and it's, a, it's such a kind of vague term I don't like people using it All right so medium is singular media uh, is a plural term meaning several different uh, types of media. Uh, mass communication and interpersonal communication bind society together. I write a lot about that. I express that in about five different ways in the first chapter. So just go ahead and, and review that and make sure you understand um, that there are different ways that that functions. But generally, mass media, uh, the messages in mass media are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and about how our society is doing. Messages in the mass media can but don't necessarily <clears throat> influence our social structures and our cultural preferences. So, you know, a news story uh, or a film might come out that changes the way we think about our society and, you know, the, the way that we're evol evolving as a, as a society. It might, you know, make a big impact in culture or it might not. Not every mass media message makes a huge impact. Um, you should know that the first mass medium was the penny press, and I love asking that question on quizzes just because I have a background in news, and I think it's important to know that what made it a mass medium uh, was sort of a confluence of different factors. Um, it was affordable to a mass audience. It was uh, directly marketed to them as a version of a newspaper that they would be interested in. And it only came after... <clears throat> people were literate, uh, and people would, you know, they would learn how to read so they could read the Bible in most cases and then read other books. Um, but I would not consider books to be mass media because, you know, very few books were mass produced. The, the Bible might be the one exception to that rule, but it certainly wasn't mass produced, you know, daily with new updates um, to kind of keep people updated um, on current events uh, and, you know, sort of constantly talking about the world and, and orienting themselves to the world uh, on a consistent basis. So um, we're going to definitely talk about the definition of society, culture, uh, and penny press uh, as the first mass medium. Um, stewing, we move further down in uh, that chapter, and there's a couple other concepts I want to convey. These aren't textbook definitions, so to speak, but these are concepts that you really need to understand. Networked digital communications collapse space and time <clears throat> even more completely than the telegraph, telephone, television, right? They cover space. Uh, they do it more completely than those other uh, media did uh, uh, or those other information communication technologies did because now uh, information travels faster and massive numbers of people have access to the platform. It's as though every smartphone were a transmission and receiving station. You can broadcast and receive uh, as well as any telegraph, telephone, or television could. In many cases, you can share high-def video, obviously clear audio, um, <clears throat> across the world instantaneously through various platforms like um, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, you should conceive of YouTube as a social media channel. I know it's not one of the big ones that automatically comes to mind when you think like Facebook and Twitter, but YouTube um, is often used for back and forth communication. Demassification signals the breakdown of the old sort of always there audiences. Uh, and 
the beginning of the need to build fan bases. Um, the, the image I want to paint for you when it comes to demassification is uh, families sit in front of the television at um, 6.30 at night <clears throat> to watch uh, either a, a news program or an entertainment program. That's sort of appointment viewing where the whole family would sit around and watch one of three or four or five television channels at the same time every week. It doesn't really exist anymore. Um, you don't have a you know an audience of you know four or five, ten or twenty million people for any given show. Um, audiences are splitting up because there are just many more options for them to choose from. And so we in mass media need to be in the business of building audiences and building fan bases, not just assuming an audience will be out there to consume whatever stories we have to tell. Demassification is another one that I always love to throw on quizzes because it's a very important concept and it's kind of a new one, so I want to make sure people review it. Convergence refers to combining old media types onto one platform. Uh, and that's what this image is supposed to represent, the convergence of text, photos, audio, video, graphics, animations, etc., all on one channel. You know, those used to come uh, in, in the context of traditional or uh, so-called old media, um, you know, sort of one per platform. Television was the video medium, radio was the audio medium, film was a combination of the two, but in, you know, more carefully uh, planned out fashion. Um, now we have devices, and now we have platforms that can mix everything together in you know single products. Um, all that's left are the old media or the icons. I also touch on disruption in chapter one. The field of mass media has been disrupted by digital technology. Old institutions are breaking up. It's not only because of digital technology that mass audiences are breaking up. There's also just been uh, decline in people's uh, trust in certain forms of of news media uh, over the past um, 30 or 40 years. It's not only because of the introduction of the internet and other digital technologies that that audiences in some uh, mass media are in decline, but definitely processes sped up um, as you know it, new information and communication technologies emerge. And so this is. Um, from Henry Jenkins, this quote's great, says our focus should not be on emerging technologies, but on emerging cultural practices. And what this is telling us is not to get too fascinated by Snapchat because maybe Instagram will just add a stories option pretty soon. And don't go too crazy for HQ trivia because somebody's going to come along and come up with something better that's not so glitchy uh, when more than 500,000 people are on it in a given night. Right. And so think about the cultural practice, the practice of coming together for a live broadcast with the possibility of winning money on your phone or on some other device and know that that cultural practice will live on or might live on even if uh, HQ trivia in its current app form uh, does not. So, you know, mark my words, a couple of years from now, there will be something beyond Snapchat and Instagram stories. There'll be something beyond HQ trivia. It'll either be a new product or a new app, or they will have reinvented themselves the way Facebook has to about every three or four months. Since the mass media and interpersonal communication both hold society together, uh, the disruption of mass media can contribute to the disruption of many other institutions. It's not the sole cause for political strife. There, there's been a lot of factors contributing to polarization in America, but um, disruption of media... Uh, it makes it difficult for us to agree on one shared message uh, about <laughs> what is going on in our society. And that can be a contributing factor to you know, some of the breakdown of institutions that, that uh, we're, we're seeing uh, in contemporary society. you got to differentiate between mass communication and interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is what it sounds like. It's in small groups, uh, and it can, you know, it can still be done over technological means. It can still be computer-mediated communication, no doubt. Uh, you can ask my SIUE colleague, Josie DeGroote Brown. She studies uh, computer-mediated communication. Um, <clears throat> but um, generally speaking, the main purpose of interpersonal communication is just to convey messages in small groups and get stuff done. Um, 
and maintain relationships and get work done in groups and all kinds of stuff like that. The mass media, um, again, tell us the stories about ourselves so that we can orient ourselves to the world so that the audience out there can better understand what society is up to and what their place is in it. All right. Uh, there's interpersonal versus mass comm. Interpersonal can function with or without a massive technological apparatus. It's more convenient, though, to be able just to text one another. When interpersonal communication breaks down, we got problems at work or in our relationships. When mass communication breaks down, society breaks down. Um, the video there is just to this Led, Ze Led Zeppelin song related to breakdown. So I think the fifth question is going to be, um, uh, something having to do with, um, disruption. I think it's important that there's a correlation between the disruption of mass communication, uh, uh, norms and institutions, uh, and, you know, broader social institutions that are starting to, to see disruption. It's not directly caused by changes in mass media, but it is definitely an influence on our broader culture. So disruption of media relates to, but doesn't cause other institutions to break down or at least to be disrupted themselves. All right, so that was a pretty long one, but I think you get the point. Uh, we've covered enough material for sure. Join me tomorrow. Uh, join me on Wednesday for uh, the next chapter. We're going to hit chapter two. And it'll be the same way. Read chapter two, watch the uh, lecture video, and take the quiz.